Fellow and well-traveled modeler Colonel David S. Graben passed away on January 1, 2017. He was 79 years old. Graben was a friend to all RC modelers and led a storied life flying full-scale airplanes in combat and for fun. RC Roundtable traveled to Colonel Graben's model airplane estate sale to record the event and see his impressive collection of models in person. We were told beforehand it was something of awe and we were not disappointed. Hi, my name is Steve Graben. I'm Dave's son. Uh, we're here in the hangar with all his airplanes uh, about ready to start his model airplane uh, sale. And not just model airplanes, we have some some we have scale ones. We have a few real ones we need to sell too, a few we're going to keep in the family uh, near and dear to us. But Could you tell us about the, the planes we're seeing? The Myers 145 is a low wing uh, retractable gear uh, economical uh, two-seat airplane with a bubble canopy, only 28 were built. He liked the historical aspect of it. Uh, he liked the tail dragger aspect of it because we live on a grass runway. And, uh, uh, and so he traded an airplane and some money for it and flew it to Oshkosh for a number of years and uh, uh, had a ball with it. And the Mooney? Another uh, another semi project that he uh, somebody down the runway had it and uh, he thought it was fun and he uh, picked it up and uh, uh, the first time I flew it uh, it brings out the uh, Walter Mitty uh, death of a salesman have fun uh, aspect because it's small bubble canopy you're just looking around for an enemy fighter from World War II to jump you and and have, wrap it up and have a fight with it. It's uh, a cute little airplane and fun to fly. Is it, is it the old adage that you don't fly it, you wear it? Basically, yeah. It's some, some bigger guys go look in the cockpit and go, uh, not me. You, you strap uh, the plane onto you? Exactly, exactly. What type of Mooney is this? What is it's it called? called? Mooney Might. It's a single place airplane and it sits so low to the ground that when you come into land, especially if you fly airliners, you go, not yet. Nope, nope, not yet. Oh, oh, oh it's got to be now. Nope, not yet. Keep going. <laughs> And it's because it's it, your butt's literally dra dragging on the grass when you land, and uh, uh, and and the gear. It's it, there's no electrical system, so there's just a glass uh, opening to look at the gear to see if it's up or down. And so when the gear's down, you can see through the glass to the ground. It's like a little glass bottom boat, so to speak. And and it really, <laughs> if you see it through the corners of your eyes when you're landing, you can see. Oh, it's getting close. Uh, I'm looking at the motor, it's very tidy. Do you have any knowledge about how many horsepower this thing is? It's uh, only 65 horsepower. It's a little uh, Lycoming engine, a uh, little four-cylinder, basically about the same as an old Volkswagen uh, in the, back in the day, the air-cooled Volkswagen. It's about the same premise. Wow. Air-cooled and economical, easy to work on. And then you have a Taylor Craft out on the tarmac. That's a two-place. He used to commute down to Arlington uh, Airport in it because uh, uh, the drive was about an hour, and it's only about 25, 30 minutes, depending on the wind, and uh, much easier to jump in it and fly down instead of getting in the car and driving. And, uh, and it's a economical, doesn't go very fast, but uh, uh, fun to fly, and, uh, and a good airplane for beginners. Uh, we have a couple people in the family that are learning to fly and are using that, and that's probably one of the airplanes we'll keep in the family. Yeah, that sounds like a great plane to, to keep. And then we have this, uh, I, I don't know enough about it, but I hope you tell me more, this beach behind us. We've been seeing it in the photos in RC Group, so I'd love to learn more about why he has it and the, the story behind it. I'm not sure the story why he bought it. Uh, when I asked him, he said he wanted to uh, turn money into noise because it's got big reciprocating engines and they use a lot of gas and uh, makes a lot of noise. It's very cool. Uh, it's not very fast, but it's a large airplane. Uh, in the military days, it would hold 11 people. And uh, in this configuration, there's a uh, pilot, co-pilot, and then four seats in a uh, club configuration. And he used to fly this to Oshkosh and up to Toledo. Uh, in the wintertime, they may still have an RC uh, type event in Toledo. Okay, yeah. And, and uh, he'd go up to Toledo to whatever that was and come back with airplanes. And, uh, in, in the in beach, the beach. <laughs> drive me crazy. So it was basically a trailer. And this <laughs> and and this airplane happens to be a uh, uh, built in uh, 42 or 43, and then the Air Force in about 51, 52 took all of their beaches. 
to Wichita, the pictures are really cool if you go on the internet. Three, four hundred airplanes, all in various disrepair. They stripped them all down, put different uh, engines on them, rebuilt everything, and basically put out new airplanes. And so this airplane has a serial number of 1952, even though you look and there's sta time stamps of 1942. And, uh, and I think he liked the historical aspect of it. Uh, it's painted up in camouflage and has a couple of general uh, uh, stars on it, even though in World War II it was a bombardier trainer. It actually had a plexiglass nose on the front of it to help train uh, bombardier, bombardiers. Do you know when the last time it was flown? About 10 years ago, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we went up to Oshkosh in it and uh, brought it back and got the gas bill, I imagine. And <laughs> 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 the noise bill. <laughs> yeah. And do you think you'll hold on to that? No, we're going to try to uh, uh, fix it up. And, uh, well, not fix it up, but try to find a home for it. Uh, there's a couple museums that are interested in it. It's probably the lowest time uh, example of its type. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the only issue is keeping it flying is the uh, wing has a uh, airworthiness directive that uh, is going to be quite expensive that's coming out next year and so you're going to have to put in about fifteen thousand dollars just for that and then the rest of it is another five ten thousand dollars to do the maintenance on it to get it flying so it's a big bill to get it going so we got to find the right person right person yep. yeah but uh, I guess my qu next question would be I you know, definitely a love of aviation how about the family who else uh, flies or either RC or scale uh, most everybody flies real airplanes. Uh, I don't mean, That's okay. I, I didn't mean big airplanes. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law, when he married into the family, he was already a private pilot, but he thought the airline industry was kind of fun. So he ended up with the airlines and through all the different mergers, we're now working for the same airline. And uh, my little brother uh, started uh, his flying lessons and uh, went all the way up to almost taking his private pilot's license, but girls and uh, teenage years got in the way. Um, and uh, then my uh, nephew is flying, and he's about ready to take his private pilot's license. Good history of aviation in the family. Can you tell us uh, some favorite stories of your father, uh, whether it was uh, you know flying military or, or say recently if he was flying some of these modern aircraft? Uh, one of the more humorous ones, uh, he was given an instrument check ride uh, to his boss, uh, the commander of the, the base over in Japan before Vietnam. They're in a two-seat airplane. Uh, the, uh, he's in the front where he can see. The uh, colonel is in the back with a hood over the canopy so he can't see out, so he has to be on instruments. And he's given an instrument check ride, and uh, it's a single-engine airplane, and the engine fails. And they're over the ocean off of Japan. And... Uh, and the colonel, for whatever reason, never pulled back the hood. He just kept talking to dad. Hey, you know, what do you see? Well, there's an island up ahead. Yeah, we can get over it. All right. And so they basically glided down over the ocean, uh, over the, t t they were over the island. And uh, the colonel said, tell me when it's good to go. And dad said, it's probably good to go. And before he finished the sentence, the ejection seat left. <laughs> <laughs> and dad says, oh, I better go now. And so he straightens his back up because it's hard on your back. And he put his knees in and he pulled the ejection handle. And he's thinking this all takes, you know, 5, 10, 15 seconds. And, and afterwards they did the math and it was only 1.3 seconds between the two of them. And uh, they both landed within a couple hundred feet of each other. His, he landed in a, a, in a rice paddy and uh, not, uh, didn't have any injuries. His boss landed in a tree and he was being strangled by the parachute uh, risers because his, it, one had gotten caught underneath his chin and he's you know, gagging and yelling and screaming and kicking his feet and he's only five, six feet off the ground but it's forever for him. So dad goes over and cuts him down and, and uh, they both end up in the hospital and uh, just to be checked out and everything's fine. And uh, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, the colonel starts hollering, having nightmares. Dad doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, but it's nightmares and he just, he can't stand anymore. So he goes over and yells in his ear, shut up! 
<laughs> Quiet it down. Didn't wake up. It worked. Dad went back to his bed and went, bed, went to sleep. Wow. And uh, I don't know if it's the seat, but there is an ejection seat up there that uh, uh, supposedly... Yes, you, get to, you get to keep the seat. Well, we, we've had it growing up. We keep talking about not... We didn't have video games per se growing up, but we keep saying now that would make a great gaming tape, gaming seat. That would be the there. ultimate flight simulator seat. Uh, you know, so, you know, it, it's just a matter of finding time to dust it off and setting it up. As, I love that story. We don't want it. Let me know. It's, yeah. Well, see, we knew he had ejected from it, but th that makes it so much better. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're here because we're looking at this incredible collection of RC stuff. Do you do you guys fly RC? Have you all? Did you all ever uh, we, we've tried. We we've never had much luck, and my father was always upset about uh, the airplanes crashing. When I was when I was younger, uh, we built a uh, a glider and we covered it with clear. Uh, Sikonite, Monocote, whatever, and uh, had a little 049 uh, pod engine, and we got it running backwards, and we didn't know it. So we hand launched it. It went about five, ten feet, stopped in midair, fell off on a wing, and uh, we went, oh, shucks. We go and pick it up, look at it, looks fine. So later on, uh, we're flying it, and uh, one of our neighbors is actually at the controls, and uh, the wings folded. Down it comes. Quick as a cucumber, calm as ever. The neighbor handed dad, dad the box and said, here, you got it. <laughs> as it comes crashing down, put a two-inch hole in the neighbor's roof. And uh, needless to say, the neighbors kept a close eye on his flying activities after that. Um, do, is there anything you want to tell us about the collection you have? I mean, your feelings about today's uh, estate sale. And this is just RC. This is not the estate. This is, well, in yeah, one yeah, case, yeah, yeah. it is an estate. It, it, it is an estate, and it is RC, and it's, uh, uh, to be honest, my, mine is depression because uh, he could have enjoyed the airplanes with other people by, you know, not, not creating so much work for my brothers and sisters and I with all of the bloody, you know, it's like, it's insane. And I mean, there's easily... Two, three hundred dollars. I mean, two or three hundred airplanes here. I remember six, eight months ago, my daughter was visiting and giving them grief about all the airplanes in the house, and they made a bet, a hundred bucks, on if there was not a hundred airplanes. He said, "Oh, there's not a hundred airplanes." Well, we didn't even make it to the hangar before we were up to a hundred, so he lost that bet quickly. <laughs> Did y'all keep anything? Is there any airplane that uh, you you've kept for yourself? Something that was well, we to you? figured no. What we figured there's a few airplanes that uh, we're gonna. Uh, learn on, help our kids fly that are, you know, trainer versions, soft and easy to fly. We have the runway in the back, so we kept a few uh, to play with, practice with, and uh, a few of the cool display ones we're going to uh, keep. But, and then, you know, obviously there's going to be a few left over, I imagine. Well, so, he, he certainly was a great ambassador. I mean, he, he was always very friendly at, at the at, at best. Anyway, I know he's traveled to many others. I know Keith. And everybody Tom. I've talked to says he was always very uh, accommodating with his time. Uh, talk, you know, if somebody had a question, he'd you know sit down, and take the time to answer it, and not blow anybody off. And I haven't heard any, you know too many stories of. Uh, that, you know, unlike me being the son, you know, a little abrupt. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> well, I, I, I certainly appreciate you giving us your time. And we are, I'm very glad we got to come here and see this for ourselves. I think for me, because I'm, I'm an avid aviation buff, I love that this kind of shows his love for it. I know it's a hassle for you right now and your family, but I want you to know there's a lot of people here that are just so grateful he's been around to tell us his stories, to fly his airplanes, and, and to share his love. And, and obviously, because you guys are flying real airplanes, uh, it, it doesn't fall far from the tree. No, and that was the sad part is whenever I would want to go out on a calm day to go fly one of the RCs, he's go, oh, no, let's go take up the Taylor Craft, or here's the keys to the Mooney Might, let's go go fly that, you know, and, and we'd end up flying uh, the bigger ones instead of the little ones, and I think he just didn't want me to crash them. And... <laughs> well, thank you so much. We hey. look, look forward to hanging out with you today. All right. Yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, I'm here with Tom Blakeney, and he's uh, pretty much run the whole operation for the Dave Graben's estate, uh, monster estate monster sale. Uh, so, Tom, uh, tell us a little bit about your your relationship with with Dave and how long you've known him. Sure. Well, uh, I've pretty much started hanging out with Dave. I'd seen him around, but we started hanging out and flying together at small 
about 2005-ish or so. And, and we had, it turned out we had a lot in common, and uh, he had a lot of interesting airplanes. He was friends with Sparky, and, and uh, we got to where we met up at Small and at Best and at other local events like My Electric Fly-In, the Thunderbirds Warbird Fly-In, the, uh, and the uh, North Dallas uh, Warbirds over North Texas event. So you know, we had a lot of the same taste in airplanes, and, and Dave uh, kind of latched onto me as a test pilot. I got to fly a lot of his stuff, which was great because he had very interesting stuff. And, uh, and Dave was just a lot of fun to be around. He, he was a wonderful dinner companion. He always had a great story used about airplanes. And uh, he just made every event we went to just that much a little bit more interesting and fun because he was you know, just, a, just a great guy to hang out with. And, uh, he had some amazing stories about flying F-100s and F-105s uh, in the 60s and American Airline pilot retired and then he was a uh, FAA designated flight examiner for many years and, uh, and he was very active right up until he fell ill. Well, uh, if you could summarize uh, Dave's personality in maybe one sentence for someone who's never met him, what would you say? Um, he, he, he was kind of small in stature but he had, a, he had a big personality. He was fun to be around. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to describe it, but just basically, uh, kind of a hail fellow, well met, just, uh, just, uh, relaxed around people, very good with people, just, just a, just a genuinely fun guy to be around. Um, can you think of one of the most interesting planes you've ever had to fly of his? Let's see. Uh, what's funny with Dave, I'd fly his large EDFs, and once in a while, there would be some confusion over which battery was charged. So about, ha about on the large ones, probably a third of the time, the battery would, would dump in the middle and I'd have to make an emergency landing. So with a 90 millimeter Yak-130 and a 105 millimeter uh, HSD Viper jet. So the, both of those, but, but everything came out okay, no problems, but it was, uh, sometimes Dave's airplanes could be exciting. And I flew his giant scale Waco uh, the orange and silver one that people see in the pictures here, we were flying at best, and all of a sudden the, one of the ailerons started fluttering, so we had to land it. And once in a while, Dave could have a little issue here and there with his planes, but we usually got him back. I think I only crashed one of his airplanes ever, and I, it was partly my fault. It was a uh, ESM Hawker Hurricane, and I didn't catch that the ailerons were backward, and he didn't catch the ailerons were backward, so we crashed it. That's I think it's the only airplane Dave's ever crashed. So that was good. Do you recall any of his full scale stories that you can? Uh... Yes. Uh, they flew F-105s in Vietnam, and on a pretty early F-105 mission uh, in that, in that uh, theater, uh, he was extremely uh, shot up and, but, and just barely managed to limp back to the base, which I think was Tak Lee in Thailand. And he got the airplane back, landed, he was safe, he wasn't hurt, but the airplane was a total loss, and so that was the first F-105 combat loss in history. That, wow! So, wow! Like, not the thing you may want to be remembered for, but it's really you know the fact that he got did it and got got away safe and everything was pretty cool. Uh, now coming here, Dave had a lot of planes. I mean, oh. it, it's, it's it's insane. It, though, just to get a visualization, you know, pictures didn't do justice. He's got a lot of stuff, a lot it of was, kits. It was crazy. A lot of it, a lot of it left today, and uh, it's really been an adventure. Uh, after he passed, uh, he, he, in the state, you know, Sparky was one of his best friends. And, uh, and what was funny, one of our last messages from him when he was in the hospital is, is we were, I thought he was on drugs uh, for pain. He said, well, make sure Tom gets this and make sure Sparky gets that and make sure Richard gets this. So we were the three guys he named in one of his very last messages. So that was really kind of a you know, heart-wrenching thing. But um, so we, you know, he passed away on January the 1st and on uh, about the, the first Saturday after he passed away, we came out here and we've been out here every Saturday except for one since the, since the beginning of January, getting us ready because the stuff, you know, the stuff, he was a pack rat and stuff was all over. You know, we, we, found, we found parts to one airplane in five different locations on his estate and we matched it all back up and, and Richard and Sparky and I and a few other people here and there helped. And it, it became a, you know, kind of a labor of love to get all this stuff put back together and kind of in shape to be sold and allow, and you know, help. Well, I think Dave would be very happy to know that many of his airplanes went to great owners that are going to enjoy the hell out of them. And uh, we had, I think we had a very successful estate sale and uh, we moved out a huge proportion of the airplanes and, and uh, kits and uh, equipment and hardware. And I think the family's very happy. Steve and Eric Graben are both, uh, both liking what happened. And then, 
but it was it be, kind of became a labor of love to put his collection together and get it in shape so that we could get it out to people that would enjoy it. Wow, well, well thanks Tom, I think you guys did a great uh, labor a service to our, our old friend uh, Colonel Dave and uh, he'll be missed and uh, I'm sure they all appreciate your hard work you went into this. I'm and so glad you guys could come up and help document it because like I think I mentioned, you know, I've said this a few times, I, I put online on RC groups that it was going to be an epic event and I think it qualified as an epic event. So it was, it was fun, it was kind of exhilarating and terrifying. Last night I said, you know, what if nobody comes, but we had a great turnout. Uh, the family did well, and uh, we made a big din, and uh, now they actually have room to store everything instead of not before. It was a great event. It was far better than most of the swap meets I've ever been to, so <laughs> that was that. And, and the part of that's because Dave had very eclectic taste in airplanes like both you and I do. He had great stuff. Yeah, he did. Great stuff. All right, Tom, thanks so much for, uh, for the me, history lesson. Oh, yeah. I, do want to, I do want to thank my wife, Robin. She's been here with me the whole way, except for one weekend when she was sick. And she was good friends with Dave, and Dave too. And, uh, and uh, she, she just couldn't do enough to help make this happen. So and, and it, was, it was a big team thing, her and me and Richard and Sparky and a few other guys who helped. And uh, we're really glad. We, ha we enjoyed the hell out of doing it. We're really glad it's ne nearly over. <laughs> And with that, uh, nothing more to say on that one. Thanks.